Welcome back to all our Radio Entrepreneurs listeners. My name again is Jeffrey Davis. I'm host of the show. And uh, thank you to our uh, real host, uh, MTP Software, the leader in sports CRM, uh, and everybody else who helps support the show, all of our sponsors. If you want to learn more, just look up radioentrepreneurs.com and find our website, learn more, see, the, see some interviews, and think about people you know who may want to interview on Radio Entrepreneurs. Our next guest, John Carson student mentor at the Harvard Innovation Lab. And I know it didn't say the, but I say the. All right. I'll put the qualifier in. Okay. So tell us about your work as student mentor. Um, well, I've been uh, sort of both at the iLab and um, around Boston with other um, students and recent students. Um, you know, basically, I try to give them some guidance on how to start out and build their ideas into real operating kind of enterprises. So why did you uh, get involved with this in the first place? Um, well, you know, I started by, uh, it was um, after I sold my, not my last company, two companies ago uh, called Bidding for Good, um, after we uh, sold that exit. And so I was on uh, my favorite part of my sort of uh, kind of vocation, which is my uh, post-exit sabbatical, and the Harvard iLab asked me if I would come in and be part of their mentor program. And so I've done that at Babson uh, and, you know, on an ad hoc basis as people have reached out. Interesting. So you mentioned uh, bidding for good. Why don't we get in the Wayback Machine and go through your career and see how you built your entrepreneurial uh, bio? The journey. All right. So the journey um, starts in... Uh, I'll date myself. It starts in 1976, and I start a company to deliver kegs of beer to fraternities all over Boston. I'm a freshman at Babson, and that becomes a company with endless demand. And so the sort of gating issue was um, being able to find students who had uh, vehicles and or driving or driver's licenses who could be my delivery teams. Um, we also had a division, probably overstating it, but we had a little under a thousand of these little two by two refrigerators that we rented out uh, to uh, about a half dozen colleges around Boston. And so that was where kind of where I got my start. Uh, I have worked for two real companies, if you will, brief stints um, in the bigger scheme of things. One was Boeing, the Boeing company, uh, and the other was McKinsey. Uh, <clears throat> At McKinsey, what'd you do at Boeing? I was gonna. It sounded like Boeing was first. What'd you do at Boeing? Um, I was. A, I went into their training program as a sales rep, and so uh, interesting. Getting a little bit of scrutiny now. But yeah, um, back then Boeing was the most respected company in the country. Um, it had uh, basically launched the 747 and was sort of um, a real beacon for innovation. This was. Um, in the early days of the Reagan era. And so the country was kind of coming out of a slump. And so Boeing was a great company to work for. Uh, I got a training program. Uh, and basically, I was in their computer services division, which you could think of as the cloud. So we were in timesharing. And so I sold kind of cloud services to other larger, large and mid-sized companies in the Boston area. Um, I went to Yale and then worked at McKinsey, but I didn't like being the lowly kind of grunt analyst. I thought the partners had the better job. And so um, while I was in my second year at Yale, I found some clients and started my own little mini version of McKinsey, hired some classmates, and we were focused on small to mid-sized companies. And we set up shop in the Prudential Tower here in Boston. <clears throat> so that was a five-year run, and I sold that to a uh, insurance company called Baker Insurance Companies. And in a sort of it's a was a period of time where insurance companies were buying strategy consulting firms. Um, there were about four of those uh, transactions in about two and a half years. Um, so I sold that and um, I, uh, I learned the four best words in the English language. Um, and that is the wire has cleared. And so I was on my first real sabbatical. Uh, and so I sort of stepped back, thought about sort of um, kind of life. I went to seminars. I sort of spoke to interesting people. And I ultimately landed on education. And so education 
Uh, I hadn't spent a lot of time thinking about it as a sector and sort of what that could provide in terms of entrepreneurial opportunities. And so we're in the early 90s now, and I started a company called the Family Education Network. Uh, Family Education Network became the largest education website on the internet. Uh, about 25% of all U.S. schools built their first website on our platform. We had a big <clears throat> teacher site. We had a parent site. We had a kid site. Um, if you've heard of uh, Diary of a Wimpy Kid, that was Jeff Kinney. He was one of our first producers, and he started doing that while he was at Family Education Network. Um, so I sold that in 2000 to Pearson. Um, it was a big number, um, and I heard my four favorite words again. Uh, and so it, I took about two years off, explored retirement, thinking of, I wasn't sure what I was going to do. Um, and <clears throat> by the end, retirement actually, for me at least, was overstated. Um, it does, it really does get a little boring after like six to nine months. And you can only take so many trips and you can only play so much golf. And by the second year, I was getting antsy. And then we had our first kid. And then I was really interested in getting out of the house. And so <clears throat> I had found a uh, group that was noodling an idea. That idea became Bidding for Good. Uh, bidding for Good became, um, think of it as eBay for charities. It was the largest um, online fundraising platform um, that we use commerce. It was sort of a, we call it charitable commerce. A lot of schools and charities have auctions. And so if you put it on the internet, you get more bidders um, and you have a bigger value proposition for sponsors. And so bidding for good was a little over a 10 year run. Um, it's raised about a half a billion dollars uh, at this point for charities. Uh, it generally raises 60 to 80 million a year. Um, and I, we sold that to a company called Frontstream. Uh, and again, my four favorite words. And then that was when I ran into the sort of Harvard iLab. And when I was at the iLab, we're now talking 2015, uh, I met some kids at Harvard who had a side hustle that was beginning to get out of control. And they were basically helping families figure out the college admissions process, mostly for Ivy League type schools. Um, and they were sort of at a critical juncture of whether they should drop out, which their parents were not super psyched about, or whether they should go for it. And there was a whole long sort of fall mentoring kind of process. At the end, they decided to drop out, and they asked me to come in as their CEO. And so College Vine at that point did about $300,000 in sort of sales, 2015. And so I basically raised money, built out the management team, and got that to about a million dollars a month by the time I left early this June this year. Oh. And that brings me to today. So, uh, you know, we don't have a lot of time left, but, you know, what do you look for in someone that you're going to mentor? Because I assume you're looking for someone that you really sort of believe has the right future ahead of them. Well, I mean, the characteristics of, I think, great entrepreneurs, um, and there are a lot of good ones, there are less uh, of them are great, um, so you obviously have to have, ten, you know, it's obviously well known, tenacity and grit. Um, you have to have a vision that, you know, that is believed in. Um, less talked about is humility. Um, I think this notion of um, having a certain kind of humbleness to the sort of <clears throat> challenge of, of building, starting and building a company is, I mean, it's a big, hard thing to do. And so I think being humble, and when you're humble, you listen. So I would say that would be maybe a separate trait, but listening skills. Um, and then, of course, I would say just raw horsepower. I mean, a lot of hard, thorny problems, and you need, you know, kind of to have a certain level of sort of intellectual kind of capacity to sort of sort through and try to get to the best answer you can. Great. Uh, Going to continue with the Harvard Innovation Lab, I assume. Um, I'm actually in the process of uh, working on some couple of different ideas, uh, none of which I can really talk about. Um, but I'm also enjoying taking my kids to school and going to their volleyball games. So you're getting ready to get back up on the uh -huh. horse. Yeah, I mean, I'm always, you know, my uh, my mom uh, worked until she was 75. She was the CEO of a publishing company, and her best years were ages 65 to 75. So that's sort of my mental map. So it makes me optimistic. Yeah, yeah you know, okay. your best year. Yeah, you have experience. Yeah. You have energy. Right. Those two oh, together. Some are... energy, some days. <laughs> <laughs> Exercise. I do, every day. Uh, 
Again, we've been speaking with John Car Carson, student mentor at Harvard Innovation Lab and clearly serial entrepreneur. Uh, John, if someone wants to connect with you, you know, maybe get your help, talk to you, how would they find you? LinkedIn. Right. Good. Just look for John Carson, C-A-R-S-O-N, on LinkedIn. Harvard Island. Yep. Uh, John J-O-N, just like my partner, Jonathan Friedman. Yep. Good. Thanks Good. for being on the show today. Hey, it was great to be here. Thank you. And we're going to take a break. Remind everybody, this is Radio Entrepreneurs.